Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brittany Umar, and welcome to our Q&A forum hosted on Stock Twits. Every Thursday, we're going to be answering your questions live, and Scott Rutherford is going to be joining me in just a second. But before we get to that, we want to give you a sneak preview of a day in his life and his trading world. So check this out. I'm in a little MGM and I'm still in OH. I bought it this morning at 107.50. Apple's good. Yeah. You don't buy in the first five minutes of the day. Big I live in Jersey City. I was born in Long Island. Went to school at SUNY Albany. As a firm, we are five partners and I'm one of them. I am the strategist that puts the game plan together for about 400 traders. I kind of command that army. It's going to make us money with that. In the daylight today, if it's up or down three handles, that's when you see where other money is really getting put to work, and that's where the action is. You held 1600 the whole time? I got 1000 See, that's a growing experience for you, brother. <laughs> All of the traders trade our money, so they have to be right. They have to say, OK, I think Apple's going from 260 to 265. And if they're right, they make money. It's a good setup. Stick with the wind. Okay. It's the right trade. Don't watch it so close. Relax. Scott's coming on in a minute, so we're going to listen to Scott. Scott, technicals first. Market looks good. Volume seems a little light. What do you see? Right now, the market's been behaving very well technically. Let's talk to this guy. Now, here's a guy, Scott Redler, who does nothing but technical analysis, but puts his money where his mouth is because he's got a firm and his partners put their money in every day and trade on technical analysis. I'm not looking for a home run. I'm not. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme if I'm able to pick the direction of the market, I could book a winning trade, and I could provide for my family. There's a breakout. That is the next evolution. Good afternoon and welcome to our Q&A hosted by StockTwits. I'm here with Brittany, my co-host and moderator. This is our first live version of this recap. It's gonna be about an hour long. We're gonna take your questions live. You gotta bear with us, this will be live. We'll be looking at your names. We're probably gonna abuse them. And actually, you'll probably abuse them because <laughs> you actually have to read them, so don't take it personally. And what we're doing is we wanna have a forum where we can answer your questions. We always tweet out trade ideas, information intraday, and a lot of people don't understand exactly our methodology, our strategies, you know, our tool belt, which you hear. So this is a great way for you guys to type in, ask me questions about things that you hear, whether you're on our site at T3 Live or whether you're on StockTwits or, or any of our affiliates, and we'll try and add as much value as possible. And we're just gonna play it by ear and, and, and roam with this one. <laughs> All right, well, let's just dive into our first question then. There we go. We have one from Okra Peas, who says that IBD stated yesterday market in correction. He wants to know how much you agree with that call and how low you see us going if we correct. All right, well, I always read Investors Business Daily, besides also the Wall Street Journal, but I feel like IBD is more of a, a trader's newspaper. It's part of my routine. I do it every day. And typically, we all know that stocks, or typically, what, 70 80% of stocks move in the same direction as the market. And I would say Willie O'Neill himself has 200 years of data. So when he has us in a market-confirmed uptrend, typically, you want to be in 8 to 15 stocks or 7 or 8, whatever your comfort level is and manage them, add tiers for cash flow. So when he puts us in a, in a market correction, if you recall last week in Morning Call, we talked about how they went into rally under pressure, which was your first sign to take your foot off the throttle and maybe look for some shorts and just not being anything more than a tier one if you're like a momentum intermediate trader. So when they went to market in correction, to me, I take notice. That means I'm a little bit skeptical, but also that means we just had about five to six distribution days in the past two weeks, so we're a little bit oversold. So today, we saw a little bit of a bounce in the morning, that Q trade that I call it from negative to positive, but it really was a feeble one. So to me, it does feel like the complexion has changed just a bit, and I do think that today's low will not be the low of this corrective action, but I do see that we're not gonna have also the same type of 22% move off the highs, but there'll be a lot of levels on the way as we trade them. And I think there are a lot of questions that we'll deal with that as we move forward. So, Brittany, let's uh, take it to the next All one. All right, as we move forward, Miracle Mind is 007 <laughs> wants to know your viewpoint for next week in terms of the ES and the Qs. All right, well, this is good. This I could answer the question about the, the correction and also show you some views. So we'll go to the chart of the, the spiders first, okay, or the S SPX. So if you take a look, actually, we'll go with the ES futures. Here's the chart, guys. Okay, so if you look at the last three days that we've seen right here, okay, obviously we've been a little oversold. The high here 
in the market was what? 1422. So when you come down to as low as, what is this? Um, 1392, you could see a little bit of a pause. That's why we said, you know what, on the third down day, it might be prudent to cover some shorts. So you saw this morning, I had a spider hedge on and I went flatted on the open and I added some longs. Because look at this support, guys. This is a decent level of support. This is like your 1386 to 1388, which we're hovering right above. Now, if you look at these, trend, you know, these trends that have developed, here is the macro trend that if you're a macro investor and that's what you do, you haven't really even had a bat an eye because we haven't even tested it. You know, if you look at these two trends, here is your intermediate trend. By the way, this is when uh, IBD put us back in a confirmed rally on this day. So, so from here at 1250, they put us in a confirmed rally. If you pick stocks that you like then, you had a move to almost 1400, 150 handles. So when they put us in correction, you take notice, especially considering we broke this momentum trend and now we're at the intermediate trend. So right now I'm watching 1386 to 1388 very closely. Okay, and if we break and close below this level, the next level is the 50 day. And that also correlates to this last breakout, which is right around 1370. So for next week, I'm gonna watch this area, okay, which is short term support. And then this is bigger support. And people ask me about probabilities. I think there's about at least a 75% probability that we touch or we test at 1370 to 1375. All right, well, pretty fitting that we're talking about the SPX because we have a question from P. Perlman who asks if you think we're correcting 5% here or no. Well, uh, that's a good question because nobody really knows. And that's why you have to have levels along the way. You know, corrections have different types of definitions. Last year, a correction was 22% off the highs. You could also have the definition of a correction if you pull off 3 to 5% off the highs. So no one really knows the type of correction we're going to have. So that's why we're going to measure the action along the way. So if you go back to the chart of the S&P, you will see that here, well, this would be, um, I don't know, about a, point, a percent and a half off the highs or maybe two just off the top of my head. You know, so at this point, I wouldn't even think about 5%, 7%, 9%. Look at levels. Here is level one, which we're holding for now. If we don't get back above, okay, I want to show you something here. If we don't get back above, just say 1407, okay, which is this momentum trend. If we can't reclaim the 10 day, then I think that gives us signs that we're at least going to go to 1370. And I think in my gut's telling me we could test this 1340, but I don't think we go much lower than that. So I'm looking at a correction from here. Here's a pause. Here's a pause. And this would be a very compelling area, but obviously we'll measure it along the way. And if you just look at what happened here, just so you could know, this was the first time we corrected, okay, in the course of uh, this year from the December 20th gap and go. And look what happened a few days after. The next two days, we engulfed this entire day. So right there, I remember that very well because I did go from about, uh, well, I think, 10, 12 positions to, to flat here. And then on these two days, you were able to see the leadership develop and then get back involved for what was new highs. So now if you look where we are right now, look at this day. This day wasn't as decisive, obviously, as this bounce day. So right there, it's showing you a little weaker type action, but you also have the jobs number tomorrow. You have a long weekend, you have light volume. So, you know, at this particular point, you know, to say 5%, to say 7%, to say 22%, I think is, is irresponsible. Know these three levels and we'll watch to see the futures or the, how the leaders act. Because right now the rally is getting a bit more narrow. So, you know, I do think that we, we haven't seen the lows yet of this little type of move here. Well, if we do see that correction, we actually are getting a question from Andy Singal. Sorry, Andy, if that's not right, doing my best. But he wants to know which stocks would be a better buy for this quarter, what your target is on IWM, if any correction. Well, right now, I don't think we know what the complexion is for the second quarter, except for that it's weaker, obviously, than the first quarter, because typically the leadership changes. OK, and right now we know that, you know, Apple's been a, a home run every day going higher somewhat. Priceline's been really strong. You know, Baidu's been OK. Google's been all right. The casinos have been strong. Retail's been strong. Home builders have been strong. And commodities have been weak. And we haven't seen any of that really change it. So that's what we're watching for. As far as your question on the Russell, the Russell gave us some clues that we were heading down the last little corrective type action. And now it's also leading us slower, which to me is a bit more of a, a danger sign because, you know, the Russell is the smallest companies out there, usually high growth companies. So typically you want growth to lead us higher, not lower. So if you look here at the IWM, this will give us some clues also on, on the future action. OK, if you remember here, um, this was the last time we broke below this mini channel. OK, and that was to the downside, but it held the Oops, sorry. It held the, get off of there, okay? <laughs> it held the 50-day, okay? So now you had to move back up to highs, 
you know, which was really like almost a false breakout, to be honest. And, and now we're below the 10 and 20, and we're like a little below the 50. So last time we spent two days around the 50 and bounced hard. If we spend a few more days down here in this lower end of the range, I would say if we break this little 80, you know, this 80 area, you're going to see a retest of this area, and that will also bring the rest of the market lower. So watch this area close. If we stay in this lower end of the range and no big bounce, I see us breaking this. You could probably get shorted and then see how we act a little bit, you know, around 78, which was our previous low. We're getting a lot of great <laughs> questions here. We have one from Minervous Big. Assuming we are entering a correction, perhaps 5 to 10 percent, do you change the way you pick stops? Uh, def stop, I mean, stops on your stocks? Yeah, you have to be a lot tighter because once if you're in a corrective type of tape, you don't know where it's going to go. So you want to make sure that, you know, if this isn't the spot that we hold, you could trade a level versus a level. And that's what I like to do in that corrective type phase. I like to actually use the red dog reversal sometimes, you know, as, as a tool or as a strategy, because typically what happens is you make a low, you come off the low, okay, and you look for a reversal pattern, and then at least you could have, a, a, you know, you could buy it and use the low as your stop. So like example today, okay, if you look at the spiders, okay, let's we'll go go the inch a day on the spiders. Okay, we'll go to the, the three-minute chart so you could see how I, I, I thought of them today. Okay, you know, right off the bat, we made a, a quick low, right? Right into that 9.30 time slot. And if you go real quickly to the 34-minute, you could see, you know, from, from 142, right? From 142 all the way down to where we started today, okay? Um, you know, that's a, what was that, a three-point move or a three-point down move? So you don't know what type of bounce we get. So if you went back to the three-minute chart, you would see that you know you put a pivot low here on the bottom okay so i'll go over a few different things right here with a few different strategies so if you were looking to cover your shorts it would have been nice to cover right around the open if you were looking for a cute long which i call it which means you just want cash flow here's your little bottom okay we came back above this little pivot okay once we came back up this was if you if you covered here or didn't buy here that's fine it happened quick this would have been your buyable area okay you had a nice uh, pivot from the open. It went above 139.60 and it filled the gap. Okay. So right there, that could have been your cute cash flow trade. Okay. Where this is a little sticky. Sorry. Um, and that was your cute long because today I said, let's look for just trades to take cute longs. And right here, it could have been from 39, 139.50 to almost 140. Okay. And then it held higher. It held this area showing some commitment. Then you got a little bit of a push. Okay. To prior resistance. Okay, which is right there. So that's why I paused there. Came back in, held support, and then made new highs. Okay, 140.20. So that was an area that I said also in the note that, you know, 140.20 to 140.50 would be a tough area to get through. So the easy part of the bounce and what could be a corrective tape took place. So moving forward, if you were a trader and you said, okay, I want to have a stop in, okay, right here, you would have bought it. Let's go back to the chart. You bought it right around this 139.50 and said, my stop is the low of the day. So I'm giving myself like 20 cents stop, okay, for what wound up being, you know, a, a decent 70 to 80 cent trade in the spiders. And obviously stocks did much better. So when you're trying to pick a low in a corrective type tape, you want to do a level versus a level. You don't want to just buy, 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 because you don't know where, when the bottom is going to be. And that's how you get put out of business. So a level versus a level during a corrective type tape. Then once we get that new formula that could be a buy setup, then, you know, we put on some swings. All right. Well, I'm just keeping my eyes on these tweets that you guys are sending in here. And we've got one from Rob Royale who asks, will a move down to 1370 on the S&P negatively affect earnings announcements or do earnings always take precedence? Well, what I, what I think coming into earnings, it's actually good that we're, we're correcting a bit. Okay. Because if we were at 1420 going into earnings, you know, I would say that any type of report could be sold because they want to sell the news. So by coming lower, I think earnings are going to be very specific. Different companies are going to have different reports and some are going to gap and go and continue. Some are going to be priced in. If you look at something like, you know, what Bed Bath & Beyond today, you know, even in um, a, a very negative tape, okay, you see a stock like this that was able to gap up into new move highs. And, and, and they were rewarded for good earnings. If this was such a negative tape, it would have gapped up, they would have sold it down, and that would have been that. So at this particular point, treat each earnings report separately. Know where the stock came from. And obviously, the report had to be really good considering you know, where it was. I talked about this with Jill she, you know, from Options Profit. She made a great call saying, be long into earnings, which is something that I don't do as a risk-averse trader. If you took options, great. Look at this. And now let it go sideways. And if the market corrects and this stock just say can't fill this gap, and hold sideways, there will be another trade as it goes above this high. But right now, 
I think that getting down to 1370 into earnings season makes it a lot more company specific where if a stock you know has great earnings and good guidance it could be rewarded if it's not good like you saw with Sandisk or they pre announced they're gonna get bashed and Sandisk everyone knows is my nemesis I'm glad no I'm not glad you know you want to see something like that but you know stock got hurt and at this point that stocks in the penalty box I don't ever really want to talk about it again <laughs> well for, at least for another week <laughs> all right well since you're diving into specific stocks we have some questions here about some specific ones Blake Smith is here is asking for you to please go over the tier for cash flow scenario again he says he can't quite follow your JPM tweet covering the same subject thanks in advance he's very polite so we have to answer him Thanks in advance before <laughs> I answer the question. So there you go. Okay, so you know if you're a member of T3 Live and part of our virtual trade floor, you could see our positions go on live. So you could see it turn green on Twitter. You can't really see it. Sometimes I have enough thumbs to tweet about it. Sometimes I'm just too damn busy. So yesterday on the close, after a three-day pull, and I said, you know what, I'm going to buy a little bit of JP Morgan down into the 44 area, and I'll, I'll look at the lower as a stop. So I took some overnight. So that was just say my tier one. So on the open, we'll go to JP Morgan. I said, I'm gonna give it two, okay, um, the low of the previous day. And I think I tweeted saying that 4380 is gonna be my hard stop. So if you look right here at the morning open, this was the low. It was a little tricky on the open. It looked like it was gonna break it and didn't. So I'm still in tier one overnight. Okay, I went to probably tier two and a half once it broke above this uh, morning print pivot, which was right around, four, I think the number was 4415. So if you were in tier one overnight and you held and you didn't get stopped out using the low, okay, once it traded above this 4415, that's when I added for cash flow. I said I'm getting involved because it probably fills the gap because JP Morgan just came off and buying the dip has been prudent there. So I'm adding here, okay, and I did add, I probably went to tier two and a half a little bit bigger. And then on this move to fill the gap, I got back down to I would say a little bit more than I had overnight. So right now I'm still holding it from yesterday. You know, I have a tier one, I add. Uh, right here because a great intraday pattern you know went up about you know a nice 30 cents decent percentage for JP Morgan so that's when I sold some okay got back down to tier one and a half and then I went to see how it would hold up so now all of a sudden you know JP Morgan's back into some resistance you see a mini downtrend here I want to see if it would hold higher at that point you saw some other banks go positive so I stayed with my tier you know just a you know one ish or one and a half you could have added again right here for cash flow but obviously this time was a little bit riskier considering where it came from but it was clearing a level so you know it went above the previous high I, I think I tweeted saying I'm taking some off I went over the tier system on Twitter take took some off went back to what I really had overnight so now I'm still in from yesterday around 44 I've been holding it here all day. I traded along here, sold some, long here, sold some. So now I booked two trades along the way and I'm holding a, you know, a decent amount. And then you know, it, we did come in towards the end of the day, but I didn't mind because I'm still above where I bought it yesterday and I took trades along the way you know, for cash flow and I'm still staying in the position. And to be honest, I think that it showed some weakness today you know, as far as JP Morgan. So I don't know if today's low will be that low. So just looking more at the macro chart here, uh, I'll expand upon it and give you a little bit more. I was, these are the lines that I actually drew. You know, this is the low 4381. Um, I would say if it can't get back above this, um, let's, let me get you that little, little pencil here. If it can't, you know, if it can't get back above here and stays in the lower end of this, just say now channel, so to speak, I do think that, you know, if the banks are going to lead us lower, the market can go lower. And then you could see about, you know, 43 to 4280, which would be another level. That's why I'm keeping it, you know, light right there. Now, is there anything you would add to that for Flotastical here, who Ooh. actually, Flotastical, Flotastical. He, I like it. he held it from overnight yesterday as well. He says, what was your out in JPM this morning? I held it overnight from yesterday and had a stop below yesterday's low. How would you have traded it? So anything else specific you would add to that for him? No, same way. I had to stop at the low also, and it never went through the low. It almost did. It was really close. If you were trading JP Morgan this morning, it looked a little weaker before you know, it had that rally, but it never traded through. And there was another question I think I saw go by about, you know, do you think that having stops in at the low or at the previous high, if you're long or short, um, doesn't make sense because, because of all the computers and the high frequency trading that you know, the computers have it there. So they typically sometimes they trade it through the low, and then you get stopped out and then within five minutes it's back above that low you get, you lost your stock and then it went it's not an exact science it doesn't have to be a hard I, I treat actually the overall market with zones now i don't give a specific number like i'm talking we're going to probably have 1370 
to 1375 because again the box know what where we're looking with technical analysis so they want to get you out of it okay same way now even at this upper zone i'm looking at like 1386 or 1384 to 1386 versus a hard number so again hard numbers with the way the algos are, are written against technical analysis i wouldn't do it i would treat things more as a zone versus just a hard stop. But for today, I had JP Morgan as a hard stop, and thank goodness you know, I stayed with it because it actually was my cash flow for the morning besides Apple. All right, well guys, keep sending in these tweets and these questions because we're gonna tackle some more right after this. Hi, I'm Sean Hendelman, CEO of T3 Live, where we train, coach, and mentor traders in order to help you put your money to work with confidence. The T3 Live approach is a blueprint for you to recognize, adapt, and ultimately take advantage of different market conditions. To begin your training with T3 Live, we would like to offer you the opportunity to enroll in our free 30-day online home study course. Fill in your name and email address, and I'll see you on the other side. We're back and we're answering lots of your questions from our stock twits. We have got one from Nico Spitzis, giving it my best shot. He's saying, <laughs> looking to take a sizable position in Apple in investing account. Target set over 700, want to wait for a pullback. Do you think I will miss it? He also <laughs> says thanks already. <laughs> okay, well, a lot of play people. Um, <laughs> anyway, if you're not in a position in Apple yet, it's hard to initiate into this strength. I'm sorry. Even though I do think it goes over 700, you heard the price targets of 1,000, 1,001. So uh, I do think 700 will be reached at some point this year, but if you're going to enter it up in these areas, you just have to be prepared that you could get a little bit of a pullback. And lately, if you look at the chart, which I'll show you, if you want to initiate a position, I'd rather see you initiate it around the 10 day or the 20 day. So if you look at the chart of Apple, you will see that Apple, you know, in this beast of a run, you know, we talk about this every single day. You know, if you remember, it seems like this was a decade ago, this was the earnings report, it gapped up. So if you didn't take the stock into earnings, this was that three day move, held the gap, showed power. This is when I entered it. Okay, and then you could have added for momentum. And I think, you know, as a macro stance, I took some a little bit early. And then since then, it's been a good trade. And if you look here, you had that outside day on quad witching or whenever that was, okay, and we held the 10 day. You had another nice move. Here, we came back to the 10 day and held the 20 day. So that was a decent entry for, you know, a buy the pullback. And then here was a good entry for traded through recent highs because if you were short Apple uh, through this level and you think it's going, you know, you got to cover. So that was another nice move. So anyway, um, at this particular point, it's extended from the 10 day and the 20 day. So to buy it here, I don't think that um, for an investment, you, you really should, unless you're really just gonna buy it, close your eyes and in a year from now, open them again, which I don't recommend. So at this particular point, it was a really good day trade today, you know, when it broke yesterday's high right here. Um, and it also broke above this previous high of 632. So I do think that, you know, if the market opens up positive with the jobs number on Monday, it's going to continue higher, but I don't want to see you chase it there. But the trend is strong. And I don't think even though everyone on TV, all they want to do is compare this to Siena, JDSU, you know, big market leaders of the past. I still think the valuation is cheap and they don't have to have explosive new um, products that, you know, if you look at, I have a, an iPod, an iPad, uh, a Mac at home, my wife, my kid. Like I look at people walking around with a rim or a Blackberry. Do you have a Blackberry? No way. <laughs> <laughs> Been on Blackberry me co-host in the show. I'm like, what are you still doing there? So anyway, I think that Apple is still going to be a good investment. And as a trade, <laughs> I'd rather see you buy it on the 10, 20 day. And if you're trading it for momentum, look at those pivots because those have been great actionable areas. And I have them on my price point sheet usually. Well, speaking of Apple, we're getting another tweet from MSP Zoom, who says for the very strong names, MasterCard, and Apple, Visa, those A-type names, are you setting up for them to be affected by the correction? Well, right now, the, the rally is still narrow and they're still being greeted with love. Okay, but what's going on is sometimes the market lulls you to sleep where they have the leaders going up, making the headlines, and they're selling everything underneath. So that's why I want to be a little bit cautious because those always do get hit, but they get hit at the tail end because they want to hypnotize you with Apple new highs and strong stock new highs. But until that changes, you can't fight it. And we'll see it when it changes. So if you look at strong stocks, look at this. Look at MasterCard. This has been in the morning call so many times. You know, it was a little bit faulty on this day, but now it closed at highs. And if you're an investor, people say you can't be a stock picker. Well, if you pick MasterCard, you're really, really happy. And it's continuing. Still above the 10 day, still above the 20 day. I'd say until that changes with some authority, stay with it. Same thing with Visa. Visa also, look at this. You know, it's, it's had a nice base. 
Okay, going sideways. Hasn't done much in the last three months. This was the last time you could have bought it on that nice breakout there. And it closed on the high today. So this, this stock doesn't care that the jobs number is Friday and we can't even trade on Friday or, or that the market's in a correction. So some of these leaders are still acting well. So until they come after everything, you know, you know that we're really not in that big of a correction. So if they let stocks make new highs as we're correcting, I think that you know, shows us that the correction is going to be shallow versus fierce like we saw last year. All right. Well, I want to answer one from Ebalu, Ebalu, because he not only said hello to you, but he said hi to me. So oh, hi, Ebalu. And yeah, he's asking. You, by the way, you might get your question asked if you're really nice to Brittany. Tell her she looks good Flatter today. me and, and we'll answer that question. But yeah. <laughs> seriously, he's asking, can you kindly go over why you like Google? Okay. Um, Google, I've got so much abuse over Google, which is fine because it was slow coming out of the gates. But that's why, again, you have to know your time frame. Quite, you know, chances are, if it went right away, you know, hey, with that earnings, no one would have had enough. So you have to know whether you're a trader or an investor. And with Google, if you take a look here, the reason why I really loved it coming into the year, besides them, you know, if you go to the chart, besides them having now, you know, search, they have the Droid, they have YouTube, they're starting to monetize more businesses than search, is was this pattern right here. Okay, I was coming into December, I looked on the highs, you go to the weekly chart, and to me, it looked like you had this long, actually go to the monthly chart. You know, you had this, you know, this, this long, long base, which it still had. This, was, this is what I was looking at right here. And it's still above it, to be honest. If you look at it this way, um, it's still there. It's just, you know, we all are traders and we all love immediate gratification. So I was looking at what took place here. Stock put a high in in 2007 when it was only search. Since then, you have search, you have the droid, you have their apps, you have a lot of other businesses, you know, coming into play here. It's above the moving averages. So I thought it would break out above this area, which it did, you know, quickly. And, and then go above these recent highs, which I still think it happens at some point over the next year or so or sooner. So right now we're on the monthly chart, we're still above it. So it's still fine. But you go back to the daily chart, you know, which is what we all look at. Okay, this was that, you know, that quick move, which we did make money for cash flow, which we talk about cash flow and macro. But as a macro investor, you probably stayed in it. As a, as a cash flow trader, I didn't like the way it pulled back right to this area. It should never pull back that far. If it was going to stay strong and composure was going to stay intact for a higher move, it would never have filled this gap and would never have came all the way back into the base. So here's your earnings day. You know, closing the highs, I did not take them. I took calls that went worthless and I lost money anyway, but at least it was premium paid. That's what I do on earnings. I usually take options, not stock. So here was your gap down. So as a macro investor, you had to suffer. You suffered on this gap down. But we talked about a plan to buy a bit more into what was the previous support Okay, and also this was a 200 day at the time, so you could have brought down your average cost as a macro investor if that's what you do. But then as a trader who didn't take it into earnings, there was a nice little cash flow trade right around here, right? Stocks typically fill their gaps, and 591, you had a quick two day Q trade, which is what I call it, to 610, right? $20 in two days, not so bad. Then it you know, just went sideways in this small little box type channel. Here was a nice trade, which I didn't buy because I've been avoiding Google a bit lately. You know, you had a move to make a lower high here, and now it's holding pretty well. I drew this line this morning in morning call. I said, as long as Google holds above this 625, I think we'll see some momentum to continue. But obviously, we have to wait for earnings. So I do at this point, I do think there will be a time that Google takes out the highs of the year and those old highs of 750. I do think that they would have done it a hell of a lot faster if these stocks would just split. You know, Baidu split 10 for one last year, and now it's like 145. Do you think Baidu would be 1450 if they didn't split 10 for one? I know people say, oh, well, it's the same market cap, it's the same this, it's the same that. You know, trading is about psychology and it's about supply and demand. Okay, same way I don't feel comfortable holding size in Google because it's so slippery and so wide. You know what, if they split this stock four for one and it was 100 and change, I'd be a lot more comfortable, so would an investor at home, so would institutions, and that stock would be back at the highs and making new highs if they would just split it and just put their ego to the side. But obviously, you can't take your wishes into the market or your hopes, so we'll take it and it is what it is. At this particular point, I'd like to see you know, the 625 hold. Maybe you buy a little bit there, and then at some point, you know, you're know, going to have to take some risk with earnings. I'll probably use options. If you're a macro investor and you held the last quarter, you're probably going to have to hold this quarter too, and I do think that you'll be fine over time. Now, it's funny that you mentioned Baidu because we've got one from Kwindu who asks, what do you think about Baidu and LVS? Is it time for macro long and where are the target prices? If we were in a, in a confirmed rally right now and not in a market correction, I'd be in a lot more size in those. Okay, but since we're in that correction, I'm just being a little bit more skeptical, taking a little less. Baidu, like I just said, 10 for one. Again, it, they were smart. It wouldn't have been $1,450 or no, I'm telling you. It would have been a, 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 what's that thing in the sky usually that flies over the games? 
A blimp. <laughs> yeah, a blimp like everything else. Like you, like even Apple. Every day they got to talk about the price of Apple. They're not talking about the valuation. They're not talking about their earnings. They're talking about the price. So anyway, Baidu split, it was, it was you know, very strategic. And if you look now, last time I really talked about Baidu was right around here. Okay, this was the last chart pattern that, that I liked. Okay, remember this downtrend that we talked about? Okay, if you look here, it actually set up pretty well. Um, first thing to put in, uh, you know, you have your trend here, which here's your, like your macro trend. And then here is more of your accelerated trend that has been intact. So if you bought it every time it came in to test this area, you were able to buy the dip. So for us as momentum traders, we love to buy high and sell it higher, like some guy's book that I don't want to talk about. But anyway, um, this was that area of 140 that we talked about. Okay, from 140, great little trade, went as high as 155 quick into this resistance zone. That's why you map out where they can go. Evan Lazarus is usually the king at mapping them out. He's also on Twitter, find Elaz. And then here he goes, a little bit correction. So if you look today, you want to see what's still strong. And Baidu is still strong. Baidu held uh, the 20 day, didn't get down to there. It took back the 10 day, which some market indices haven't done yet. It held above this pivot. And I would say for cash flow, you know, I would say through, or I'm gonna say, cause I'm saying it now, 148.50 would be another viable pivot. And then you have 155. I don't think it's gonna make, you know, new highs until earnings. So we'll see where it is then. But for right now, this is showing leadership. And um, what was the next stock that they had on there? Uh, well, we've got one actually from Kendall RR who took us literally with the flattery. So <laughs> <laughs> because he paid me a compliment, we're gonna ask, uh, answer his question. How would you play the upcoming Facebook IPO? Ooh, so we're going to skip LVS? Would you like to dive into LVS? Let's go to LVS first, oh, just because okay. I'm in the mode, and I like LVS. I'm Let's long do LVS. It. Okay, I'm going to show a few different ways to trade LVS, and, and using the tier system, so hopefully I'll answer a few questions of like a cute cash flow trade versus a macro hold. So if you look here at LVS, let's get the chart up. LVS, I'm going to break it down a few different time frames. Okay, first things first. Okay, this is when it broke out on earnings above what we were talking about, you know, right here, this 50 area. Okay, if you remember on Kramer's show, I talked about 54. I said if it breaks above 54, okay, this would be a, a great a momentum trade through the highs. And it went from 54 to 57, pulled back, whatever. Okay, now it's going sideways again. Okay, I'm in this one. So in this, it looks a little messy, right? You, you see here, but it, it's holding the moving averages. It closed strong today. If it takes out um, this, what, 59 and change, it looks like it's gonna go at the highs. And, and if you look again at the daily chart, uh, does it look a little extended? Yes, but it's just consolidated. But if you look at the, the monthly chart, it, it looks like it just based for a, a long time period, okay? If you look at where it came from, you know, it, it really didn't correct whatsoever. The stock was as low as like two bucks or even lower. It, it broke out of this channel type formation, which is why I was focusing on a macro level. It held in there really well. So that's why I said it's good as an investment quality. And actually let's go to the weekly chart so you could see it a little closer. Um, here, here, here again is um, that, let me get rid of this pencil. Okay, there you go, sorry. It's a little slow, we have a lot of people online in the bandwidth. So here's a weekly chart. This, is, this was one macro breakout. It's been flagging, going higher since. We have another flag. Uh, base on base uh, type of setups are a little prone to failure, so that's why I'm not gonna take huge size if it breaks above 59.50, but I do think it can make new highs. And if you go back to the monthly chart and I can give you uh, a spot that could be reached, you know, you could draw a line right to some resistance right around here. This area right is, uh, I, actually I think even higher than my targets. This low here on the monthly chart is um, 63.50. So that starts the resistance zone. And then I think the one above it is like 68. So 63 to 68 is where I think it can go this year and maybe even higher. So here's that chart. But now I wanna talk a little bit about the intraday because this was something I took home last night. Took it home last night. People like, you know, I thought we were in correction. Why are you taking any stocks home? I'm like, you know what? We just pulled in three days. If some things are gonna bounce, they're gonna be my favorite, someone acting strong. So I'll take a tier one home and then look to add if we see some type of bounce. So if you go back to the chart LVS, you will see here, go to the daily, and now I'll break it down for you on the three minute chart, okay? Here was, uh, here was the open. Actually, I'm gonna go to the eight minute chart so you could see where the void was, okay? So here was the open right around, um, right around here, right? It opened around 57. Okay, so I took it home long. Okay, I actually bought a little bit pre-market. I cheated just because I thought, uh, you know, it was gonna be sort of strong. So I bought around 57. I might've talked about it on the virtual trade floor. So here's your tier one. Okay, and then if you look at, you know, this level right here, 57.40 was a pretty big level because obviously I had a big pull in, but from 
58 all the way down to the low. It happened so quick. So this was a, a decent side void. So it was like an air pocket. It came down real quick so it could take it back real quick. So you could have added to tier two at 57.40. Then it came back to the prior resistance. So this was an area to maybe take off a tier. So in overnight, add a tier here, take some off. You're still in tier one, so you're still holding it, but you're adding cash flow. But then you said, oh my goodness, look at this. It's still holding higher. It's still flagging. It's still showing some strength, but I'm only in a tier one because I sold here. So once it starts going again, you can get back in tier two and use the morning high as your pivot because if you shorted that, okay, you'd have to cover. And if you thought, obviously, it's going through the, the macro highs, it's got to get through this 58 first. So here would be, you know, your entry for another cash flow tier. And then what did it do? It came back and filled this gap. So this would have been an area to sell that second tier again. So now you held tier one this entire time from 57 or yesterday's close to 58.40, $1.40. You added a T here made like 40 cents or 60 cents, got out of the way, proved it could hold higher. You added back a tier here, it filled the gap because stocks usually do that. So that's a spot to sell it. And then obviously it held higher again. And then at the end of the day, it went out pretty strong. So that's how you could use an intraday tier system and then still have the exact same shares you had overnight, but feel good because you booked cash flow and you stayed with the trade for what could be a macro move if you have a macro time frame. All right, solid game plan for Baidu and Las Vegas Sands for you, Kuindu. But now let's take Kendall's question about the upcoming Facebook IPO. What's the game plan for that? Um, what we're going to have to do is if you're not in the deal, and I'm not in the deal, I, I have a lot of friends in the business, and a lot of them talked about the secondary market. I think a lot of them uh, got stock around 3130, and by the time I think it closed, it might have been like 38. But that's like an 80 billion valuation. So unfortunately, when it opens, it's probably going to open about 70 or 80 bucks. And it's going to have a, a $200 billion valuation, which is definitely very lofty. So with that said, you're going to have to use my art of the first day trading, which I use for IPOs to see if you can make money as someone just trading in the aftermarket versus then investing and you need to set up there. So as far as Facebook, you know, you're going to have to wait if you're not in the deal. I tried trading Zynga off of it, thinking that Zynga and also LinkedIn were going to be strong going into Facebook. Zynga had the secondary. I wound up getting stopped out at around 12.20. Yes, today it broke price, so it's not acting well. It hasn't actually been acting well ever since the Groupon news. People lost a little faith in some of these newer social type media stocks. So at this point, I think Zynga has a lot to prove. I'm out of it as of like Tuesday. Um, LinkedIn, I still think LinkedIn is good. I think LinkedIn has a nice business model. Some sell side guys are talking a lot more positively about it. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a jobs recovery play too. This was the last time I bought it. I did sell into this strength here because my target was 105, 110. And I haven't really traded it since. I, I bought a little bit the other day, I got stopped out. I think guys are asking me on a macro level, what, what do I think of LinkedIn? I think if you have a short term uh, span, you could trade a long versus gap. I think if it continues, sorry, um, to hold this gap here, okay, I would think that's very healthy. The longer it holds this gap and shorts can't push it in, this was that Goldman Sachs upgrade, I think the stronger it is. At this point, it just probably needs some time and it needs another earnings report. Last earnings report was good, it needs a few underneath its belt and look where it came public. You know, the, the best, um, I would say the, the companies that have the biggest advances typically are new issues if you come back to me. Of the, of the previous you know, four to five years. That's where the growth is. If you look at MA came public within the last decade, UA in the last decade, um, you know, there's just the, the, the new issues, even by, like the, they're the ones that came public that have the growth that were exciting. And if they prove that they could have earnings acceleration, they're the ones that could be a double, triple or quadruple. So at this point, I think LinkedIn is in that camp, but it still has a lot to prove. I would say as a macro trade, it's a more risky one, but stay with it. And if you're a, a short-term trader, watch that Goldman Sachs guy. All right, well, we're gonna take a quick break. So stay with us and keep sending those questions in. We'll be right back. I'm in a little MGM and I'm still in OH. I bought it this morning at 107.50. Apple's good. You, know, you don't buy in the first five minutes of the day. I live in Jersey City. I was born in Long Island. Went to school at SUNY Albany. As a firm, we are five partners and I'm one of them. I am the strategist that puts the game plan together for about 400 traders. I kind of command that army. It's going to make us money with that. Is on the daylight today, if it's up or down three handles, that's when you see where other money is really getting put to work, and that's where the action is. You held 1,600 the whole time? I got 1,000. See, that's a growing experience for you, brother. <laughs> All of the traders trade our money, so they have to be right. 
They have to say, okay, I think Apple's going from 260 to 265, and if they're right, they make money. It's a good setup. Stick with the win. Okay. It's the right trade. Don't watch it so close. Relax. Scott's coming on in a minute, so we're going to listen to Scott. Scott, technicals first. Market looks good. Volume seems a little light. What do you see? Right now, the market's been behaving very well technically. Let's talk to this guy. Now, here's a guy, Scott Redler, who does nothing but technical analysis, but puts his money where his mouth is because he's got a firm and his partners put their money in every day and trade on technical analysis. I'm not looking for a home run. I'm not, it's not a get rich quick scheme. If I'm able to pick the direction of the market, I could book a winning trade and I could provide for my family. There's a breakout. That is the, the next evolution. All right, we're back. And before we get away from the topic, we want to stay with some new issues going on. We've got a question from Inwood123 asking about Caesars Entertainment. What are you thinking about this one, Scott? This one actually was so fast when it happened, and, and I'm upset right now that I don't own it, but it goes in that same psychology that, you know, new issues could be the biggest gainers if they prove themselves. This was a very, you know, thin float. And um, the, obviously, casino sector is a, a sector that I love when I trade. And if you look here at this chart, it gave you two really nice entries. This is something we put in off the charts right here. Okay, look how you had the new issue. And it shows you how you have to be careful on the new issue day. It obviously put a high in and never traded above it, so it went off my radar. It, it dribbled lower, dribbled lower, dribbled lower. I think I talked about it on, um, in that Jim Cramer segment. But anyway, look how tight this was. Okay, right here was a tight, tight, tight pattern. Um, it woke up a little bit on this day, okay, which put it on my radar, and then this is when we started buying it, and then it went up, and then what did it do? If you miss this move, because this was hard to see, unless you had a big volume filter, if you're using Mad Skin or something that showed you increased volume, and then it flagged, so this is when you could have been in your tier one, and then the price point was once it went above this 1330, Okay, that was your tier two, and then it really went already into my resistance zone. So at this particular point at 1541, it's hard to buy up here. If we could see a pullback to the 1470 area, you know, or just which you probably will see because this thing's very thin. So if something goes on and they get a big order to sell or whatnot, we'll probably be able to buy it back into this 1350, 1450 zone. But I do think that this is something to keep on the radar. This is something that could have, you know, a big future. And um, the next real pivot pivot will be right around 17. And while, again, we're on the subject of new issues, everyone sees that I'm long a little bit of Duncan. You know, I've been staying with this one also. This one, I think, all, uh, has a big future. It's like a Starbucks and a McDonald's rolled up into one. I love their iced coffee. You, were you a Starbucks or a Dunkin' fan? Oh, Dunkin'. Well, I actually drink iced coffee in the morning from Dunkin', then later in the day, you know, I, I go with my Starbucks. It's just a routine, and as a trader, we all have our routines, like my three egg whites on a cheese bagel in the morning. But anyway, so with that said, you know, Dunkin', I think, is acting well. It's not a barn-burning trade, but it's been public now for almost a year, so institutions have it in the right hands. We had a nice little trade. Um, like a month ago and then they announced a secondary and that always puts pressure on it because you have the overhead resistance blah 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 the thing is i don't want you to lose sight of it i don't want you to say okay it's slow now and all of a sudden you turn around in a year from now it's 40 bucks so if you look here at duncan you will see that you know you have a few different patterns here but overall this is a baby okay this is a baby in the whole scheme of of, of stocks right now okay this is when it came public okay obviously again just like the new issue game you know it, it, it this one actually made a new high and then once it closed back below this prior open, it was off my radar. It had a few trades in the middle. But then as it started coming back up, I saw this cup and handle, right? Here's your cup. Here's your handle. And then this was a nice breakout trade. This is when I started getting involved. I think I added here through this high. And then at the highs, you know, you always get a little resistance. And then if you add a little bit of a secondary to boot, which was priced at $29.50, um, it usually pulls into that area. And if it holds, it shows you that there's support there. Okay, so at this particular point, I'm long Duncan. And I think that, uh, you know, for a, a tier one only, um, but if the market gets a little better and this continues to hold 29.50, when this market gets back in gear, it might even do it beforehand. You could add above 31 and then above this area. And, um, you know, I do think at some point, you know, with this pattern, if you go from 24 to where this 30 is from 30, brings you above the highs. So the measured move really is about 36 that could happen this year. Obviously, Starbucks, you, know, you look at this stock. This was when I was on Options Profits, and we talked about the breakout. It's been a runaway train, looking great. And imagine if you bought Starbucks when it was a new issue huh, uh, way back here, okay, way back when it was a, a little bit of baby. And it wasn't that long ago. This was 1994. Okay, you bought this thing in 1994. 
<laughs> you've been caffeinated. Wow, what a move. <laughs> anyway, so I think that Duncan has a, has a macro investment opportunity, but it's got to report a few different earnings reports in order to get some traction and get some more following. So these are the early stages. It's a little speculative, so stay a little lighter. All right. Well, right now we're getting a bunch of questions f about one of the stocks that we like to talk a lot about on <laughs> Morning Call, Netflix. We've gotten two right here. MSP Zoom says that it seems to be sticking around 110 right now. Are there other levels? And I think this is one of your buddies, Scott. David Abraham says, what's up, Scott? It's David. <laughs> Netflix daily chart. <laughs> There you go. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Netflix is an interesting stock. You know, last year it was a momentum favorite from the long side and the short side, and it shows you how you really have to watch the price action here. If you go back to the more you know, the, the, the weekly chart, you'll see the trend that got broken. If you look at the chart, you'll see this stock you know, was, an, was a momentum favorite. You look all the way back from way back here, it just followed the trend, followed the trend all the way up. Okay, granted, it put its high and above 300. People were you know, ranting and raving short, short, short the whole way. They probably didn't stick with it and they're there, you know what, it's, you know, chopped off. So here was the first time it broke this macro trend, came down, retested it. So if you didn't sell it then as a macro holder, you could have sold it then because sometimes trends do change. So this was the break, this was the retest, came back in, you know, another lower high. And then if you look here, it wasn't looking so good. Below the moving averages and PS, you know, you had that gap down and it just went lower the entire time. So you go back to the daily chart now, you know, someone's trash is another's treasure. We talk about that all the time. If you remember, they put on our radar around 75. This was actually my go-to stock of the first month or so. On Bloomberg, I think we talked that when it was 85, saying so you can go to 130. PS went, put this little red dog reversal. Now I want to talk to you, I'll, I'll quickly get into some tactics about a red dog reversal, okay? Come back to me for a second. I'm going to use the Netflix as an example. A red dog reversal sometimes turns into a huge inflection change. What it, it, it does is it points out how to play a counter trend move with a plan, though. You know, same way when you're going, when uh, stocks come in five days in a row, you don't just start buy, 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 buy because you don't never know where it's going to stop that could put you out of business. The same way with the short, if you just start shorting it and saying it can't go higher, can't go higher, kind of like shield, <laughs> um, you can get put out of business. So it's a way to play a day and a half trade as an active trader or catch an inflection point. So if you look back at Netflix, you go to this chart, you'll see from a move from 75 to as high as 130. A lot of people are looking for a, a, a potential short type trade. So if you look here, Okay, it finally happened where it pushed through the previous high, which was 130.60. I blogged about this, I write it, wrote about it, the whole spiel. Okay, and this was a red dog reversal. It's a shooting star top. So what you could have done is when it went back below this previous high, you could have shorted at 130.50. Your high here was 133.43, so you had a $3 stop. That turned into a great day and a half trade. Next day, right, it was as low as uh, 123, so right there, that's a $7 two-day trade if that's all you take. And if you said, I'm going to trail it, it wound up turning into a move all the way down to 100, so you could have made 30 points with a $3 risk. So it wound up being a good day and a half trade and, you know, inflection swing, you know, trade. But for me, you know, I think I did it for a day and a half, and then I shorted it again when it broke this area, and then it turned into a nice little long right around here, right? Here's your descending channel, tightened up, went sideways, so it moved from... 75 to 130, corrected down to 100, made sense, traded it here, okay, at around 111, and we even said, look at the prior resistance, that's where it could stop. And then it wound up stopping there, broke this little area, and now it's come all the way back. Typically, if this was stronger, I would have think it would have held higher. You know, now it would have given me a better inclination that it could make new highs. So right now, I think it's a bit out of play. You know, it's starting to tighten up and coil. I tried being long a little bit today, you know, and it didn't really work. But I would say if it starts getting above this 112 um, area, again, and could hold above it, maybe you get another reflex move for a cute type trade. But at this point, it's really on my C list, not on my A list like it was here, here, and here. And that's another strategy we talk about, A, B, C list. You only have a certain amount of space on your real estate every day. So you only want to have the actual setup in front of you when it's on the A list. And then once you get your trade, you move it to the back burner, you put it on the B and C list. And then from there, you know, you wait for it to reset up and then you move it back forward. So that's how at least, you know, you have your game plan in front of you. And then when the market confirms it, you go for it. All right. Well, let's get in one more stock before we answer some other types of questions. Lambo Fund, I got you, buddy. You're sending in lots of questions. He wants to know about Goldman Sachs. He says, please cover Goldman. What are the levels to watch? 110 or 130 first? <laughs> Goldman Sachs, this stock is so difficult. Like, if you catch a good trade there, take it and run. The stock's been choppy. It's always in the news. For some reason, every time I've taken it home long, the next day it's got down and never let me out. <laughs> At this point, there's, such a, there's a lot of negative chatter there. So, 
Um, I, I would just be very careful. Do a level versus a level. Either, either be a little loose or you be very tight. And I tend to be tight with Goldman. So if you look here at the chart, you'll see you know, a few different times it's been good trades this year. If you go to the chart, and um, I can go over with you. So guys in the back, go to the chart. Here we go, Goldman Sachs. Anyway, see, live TV. This was the last time it was really good on earnings. It broke above this little downtrend, went sideways, you guys remember. Here was like, we talk about strategies, like this was the breakout, okay? Remember that breakout above 120? I was buying it and actually <laughs> um, Dougie Fresh was shorting it and he won this time. And uh, it really should never have came back into this channel if it was gonna be real. Sometimes you go, you retest and you go. So it came all the way back, okay, which got me out of it. And then it set up again. So if you look here, set up again, nice little inner uh, channel here, inner flag. And I remember you know, tweeting about this one above 118.50, gave you a nice clean day. And this is the day the op-ed came out. <laughs> and then PS since then, it's been very choppy. I think I drew this line saying, you know, we'll get a little bit more of a correction in the banks if Goldman can hold 125. And now it's, it's pulled back a little bit more than it should have. So this is showing me some weakness here. It's at the 50 day, it didn't really bounce today. It went positive, but then reversed. I think that, um, you know, it, it's definitely something that I would be avoiding. I wouldn't even, I would say at this point, don't look to buy it back, um, but it, it'll give us clues that if it starts heading lower, we're gonna see a bit more of, of, a, of a bank correction. Um, it is oversold, obviously, if you look here, you have 128.72 down to 118, so to short it here is a little bit tougher. I would have rather seen you short it when it broke this little floor. So at this point, I would be covering if you're in a cute short, and if you wanna to look too long, I would say, you know, give it to this area because if the market corrects a bit more, which I think it will, Goldman Sachs is going to at least go down to 114, 115. All right. Well, we're truly getting all types of questions today. We've got one from Stats Real who wants to know, Scott, what still drives you to wake up at the crack of dawn? How do you balance trading with your personal life and other interests? It's not easy. But, you know, if you, if you love what you do, you, you wake up every day. And in the market, there's opportunity every day to make money, to learn, to grow. And I'm still learning and growing every day. So for me, you know, everyone's got to relax differently. In, in our book, The Modern Trader, we talk about lifestyle and we talk about an approach. Because it can't be just you and your screen. You can't just wear your P&L on your shoulder. You can't judge yourself whether you, were, whether you made money or you lost money. You have to have hobbies and you have to have other things outside to burn off your stress. So for me, I do triathlons. You know, if you, if you read my, uh, my chapter, I'm the workhorse. You know, the other guys are the natural, the patriarch, the, the brains, the knowledge. It, it, I have to work. That's what I do. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a creature of habit and I keep a routine. And um, just to make a long story short, my best friend passed away when he was 30 of leukemia. Since then, I've been training for triathlons to raise money for his foundation. And I've just felt like every race had to be a bigger race in order to uh, raise more money. So fast forward, I'm 39, I'm doing the Boston Marathon next Monday, and then I'm doing uh, the, the Ironman New York City in August. And it's a way that I blow off steam. It's the way I think. You know, when I'm swimming on the water for an hour, I'm going over setups in my head, uh, I'm doing if-then situations, and it's a way for me to prepare and also train, which makes me feel good. Now, it's different for everyone. You could, you know, you could you know, do yoga. My wife does Zumba. Do you do Zumba? I've never done Zumba. I've heard well, it's good, though. Well, how do, you, how do you stay in great shape? Elliptical. Elliptical. <laughs> See, everyone does it differently. You know, but you don't have to go, you know, run up mountains like I do to relax. You know, you could play chess. You just do things that make you happy. If it's playing with your son, your daughter, whatever it is, you have to be balanced because there's a fine line between making and losing money in the market. You could have the right game plan, but if you're not relaxed, thinking clearly, using the right approach, you're not going to make money. Whereas the guy next to you could have the same exact um, strategy and he'll make money because he approached it well with a well-balanced plan and was thinking straight. And the only way you're going to think straight is if uh, you're even kill. Well, you just got a little pat on the back from Minervous Big, who says, good for you to be an Iron Man. My brother's been doing them since 1982-ish. May nice. you look as good as he does at 50. Well, that's actually the first time I saw uh, the triathlon. I was sitting on my couch with my friend who passed away, and I was watching Escape from Alcatraz, and I saw a 65-year-old guy on TV doing it, and I'm like, I want to be that guy. <laughs> so at that point, I was 205-pound like, defense alignment, and I started working my way down. But anyway, it all changes. You know, Life is all about changes, and you have to do what's makes you happy and just have to enjoy it along the way. Stop looking to the next step, you know, be in the moment, same way you have to trade in the moment, live life in the moment because uh, I heard from someone, it's a little harsh, but you know, live life because you, you, you're dead a long time. Anyway. All right, well, <laughs> back to strategy, yes. Eric B just tweeted, he wants to know on the daily recap, your trade entries are always based on trend lines and pivots. So do you ever use moving averages for trade entries? Of course, um, definitely, it all depends what's going on. If the whole gap and go or the whole, um, 
new rally that ignited on December 20th, we pretty much you know, rode the 10 day the whole time. And I've said it so many times, I'm like, I'm like strong stocks typically ride their 10 day and their 20 day. The indices are actually you know, riding them. So that's why twice this year, I actually um, sidestepped a pretty big down day because the two times we closed below the 10 day, I, I got rid of some of my loose longs and I went a little bit more on my hedge side. I was shorting spiders more. And that day that we were down, I didn't lose much. So if you look here at the spiders, uh, once again, you'll see that you know, during, this December, you know, during this rally, if you go to the chart that ignited right here, you know, we rode the 10 day the whole time. Here's a 10 day, here's a 10 day. This was the first time we broke it, but reclaimed it above it, held it, held it, held it, held it. And this, when we broke right here, this is when I went to cash again, not because I'm a brain surgeon, because I'm far from that, but it's because we broke the 10 day. And I said, we haven't broke the 10 day this entire time. Uh, something's a bit different. We came down, retested 1340, took it back, got back in stocks. And then here we are now below the 10 day, you know, trying to hold on to the 20 day. So I'm a little lighter. So uh, of course you, you use moving averages at times. They're a little bit more important and at different phases of the market, they're, they're, they're used for different things. So during corrections, you want to see where big money might cost average in. You also want to see which ones are the strongest because just say that the spiders come down to their 50 day during this correction and your stock only goes to the 10 or 20, it just showed your relative strength. So when the market bounces, those could be the future leaders and that's where your attention is deserved. All right, well, Red Dog, this one just caught my eye from Green Dog. Hey, <laughs> does that mean you make a lot of money always green? Well, let's hope so. He <laughs> says, what's your method or criteria, criteria for adding tier two? Do you set a buy stop limit order at a certain price or just above the overhead resistance? Well, it all depends if it's a, a cute cash flow trade or if it's a, a macro setup. So I typically have it mapped out before and I put together a price point sheet each morning and I put action areas at pivots, depending on the type of market, whether it's a breakout, whether it's a 52 week high trade, you know, it all depends on the situation. Same way with JP Morgan today, it wasn't a, a breakout trade, but it was a, a morning pivot where I said, okay, we just pulled in a little bit on JP Morgan. Um, right away, we, we opened lower, held the low, and then the, the, the print that would be a squeeze type scenario was that 44.15, so I added there, and I only wanted 40 cents. It was different with JP Morgan. And now just say, go back to LVS, I'm in just say tier one, now a little bit more if um, we open up a little softer and we start trading through this resistance area i will be adding my tier two and then i'll look to see how we handle this previous high and if we can get above it and stay above it i think we get north of 60. so right now this is a tier one and if depending on how we open because if we open up monday it's going to be there already so that's why you have to have some but since it's overnight and i'm a little risk averse i'm not going to be in tier two tier three especially with the market dynamics right now so it's all based on the setup but if you have a, a tier system, you could always hold some and book some. Everyone's like, oh, let me guess, Red Dog, you know, hold some or no, sell some, hold some, you know, because that's what I say. But that's what you do. You book a little bit of the trade and you hold a little bit of the trade based on your time frame. Because some people don't take any overnights. So the, the, the cash flow setup is all that you take. So that's why I do a little bit of both. And then you have guys that don't trade professionally or intraday all day long like we do that might trade a few times a week. So I want to give them a little bit more of a macro space. And that's, uh, that's, and that's all about that. All right, I'm gonna test your skills real quick here, Scott. Remember, remember our quick hits from Morning Call. Oh. Do this as fast as you can. We have one from Leaf West who says, if oh. tier one is say 1,000 shares in a company, how big are your trades? 200, 500, 1,000 shares? <laughs> Well, the tier system, first of all, Leaf, what up? He, he's really good. He's on the Twitter sphere. You should follow him. He, he's really good with his technicals. I use a tier system because size is, is different for everyone. I have guys that read my note that manage billions. I have guys that read my note that manage 100 million. There are guys that read my note that have $20,000 in their IRA. So I don't talk about size because it's irrelevant. It's just your conviction level. So if you want to be in something for some money, you know, you'd be in tier one. If you think it's about to trade through a price point in an actionable area, you get to tier two, tier three. If it then goes and hits some of your resistance level, you sell some, book some, get back to tier one, but stay with the trade for a bigger move. So your tier system is based on your own risk tolerance, your own time frame, and you have to figure out what that tier system is for you because if it's too big, you're not going to hold your trades, you're going to overtrade them, and you're going to get shaken out. So that's why we talk tier systems because I want to be able to have my information and content or all of T3Live's content, I want it to be used by anyone in the world, whether they're a gazillionaire or you know, the guy next door. So for, for, for the, that's why we talk about tier systems. So you know our conviction level, and that's why we talk about it on the virtual trade floor. That's why we talk it on the chat. That's the way I talk about it in the media. So it's different for everyone. 
All right. Well, I think that just about wraps up our first Q&A forum. Market Picker here just tweeted us. It. Thank you guys for staying late. So you're welcome. And thank you for <laughs> tweeting us your questions. I feel like I can go another hour. Do you guys want to stay another hour? <laughs> Not. She's got to go to another uh, engagement. It's Thursday before the holiday. I want to wish everyone a great holiday. If you celebrate Passover, happy Pesach. You know, may your matzah crack. <laughs> and uh, if you're celebrating Easter, uh, go find some of those eggs with your kids and enjoy them. But overall, market's closed tomorrow. Look at the jobs number, then turn the damn TV set off. Enjoy yourself, enjoy your family. The market will be here Monday. Have, Have a, a great, great night, night, guys.